Welcome everyone to ODR Cyber Week 2023. This is day one, and I'm delighted that we are kicking off with a demo of some sexy ODR platforms. Now that's selfish because I think I'm one of the platforms that's going to get demoed. But uh, Gary, you can you can bask in the reflected glow also. <laughs> exactly, of the yeah. Sexy ODR platform coming. I may be one of the few people in the world that thinks that ODR platforms are sexy. But anyway, it's okay. Um, I, I will move past the psychological ramifications of that observation and uh, hand the baton to my good friend, Gary, uh, who's going to be showing off his very, very cool platform, ADR Notable. So Gary, thank you for being here with us. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Well, thanks, Colin. I appreciate that. Appreciate the introduction. I'll leave aside your, your you know, now now uh, well-shared passion. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let's just move past. Yeah. And just move on. So let me uh, start by sharing my screen here. Uh, so uh, once again, thanks for uh, for inviting me to this, uh, and I, I appreciate you know the the efforts of the International Council on Online Dispute Resolution that uh, that's that have done a lot of the work in this area, and in particular, uh, you know our our the NCTDR a sponsor of this pro of this whole product every or project this this conference every year. Uh, uh, that is, a, you know, in, interesting and, and significant um, contribution to this. I, I, I will note um, that, uh, you know, that this is today's slide. And um, interestingly enough, this is last year's slide. Uh, I always kick this off. So this is my second year doing this. And I, again, appreciated the opportunity to, to introduce ADR Notable to the participants in, the con uh, in this conference. Um, and, you know, a really, frankly, an exciting year has passed uh, in, in 2023, nearly, you know, as we approach the end of that year. Um, we experienced a significant growth. Uh, and I, you know, I, it's hard to pin down why that is. It could be our product finally is just getting the name out there. But I have heard the same thing from one or two other technology service providers. So I think my conclusion is that the industry has reached a bit of a turning point and that whether and through maybe a contribution of, of factors from everybody having to adopt some technology because of the pandemic uh, and beginning to open their eyes to the to the efficiency and the and the productivity that that can can add to the practice i think there's a little bit of just age demographics going on here uh, that are favoring the adoption of technology and that comes in two pieces one is I think we have younger people entering the practice, which is really exciting to see. At a recent conference, my conference table was flanked on either side by universities that had master's degree programs in conflict resolution. And I think those are turning out folks who tend to want to enter the practice right away, as opposed to maybe law students who typically practice law in a more a traditional sense for a while first and then convert back uh, to ADR. And, and then last, I, you know, I was reading uh, the, the book by um, the president of, of, uh, of Microsoft, uh, Smith. I can't remember his first name off the top of my head. But uh, he was commenting in the early part of the book, it's kind of a biography, uh, about his being the first judicial clerk uh, to come into his judge's chambers with a laptop computer back, you know, now 35 years ago or whatever, 40 years ago. And I looked up how old he was, and he is he's basically my age. And it occurred to me that, that what that means is even, even for those who enter the dispute resolution field through more the traditional path of you know 30 years as a judge or 35 years as a lawyer or, or you know whatever, um, that that generation now is, is probably, even at, as they now reach age 65, that generation has had a computer on their desk from day one. Um, and, and I think they are now, even as they transition from a practice of law into, uh, into practicing in, in ADR, they're sort of looking around and saying, and where's the app for this? Uh, and there, there's almost an expe expectation of software that will help facilitate what they're doing. So I, I think it's, it is a really exciting time. That's the, you know, the, the, the point there is that um, I, I think I am seeing this interesting bend in the curve. Uh, to the adoption of more and more technology. So, so this year, uh, rather than simply introducing ADR Notable all over again, since we did that last year, I thought I would 
a focus on two of the key features that ADR Notable has added um, and how we approach that. And, and it's a pretty interesting um, dichotomy because one of them, we made a build decision and built it ourselves. And in the other case, we found uh, a software we could license and, and then integrate. So we did a buy decision. And I think this is, it's an interesting oh. lesson in any feature enhancement of an existing software, you go through this analysis to say, does it make sense for me to build this or does it make more sense for me to try and buy it? Now, just a quick reminder of who we are, who ADR Nova is, so just a little bit of looking in the rear view mirror. Um, we are a case and practice management software uh, that tries to address the, you know, the myriad administrative tasks that are essential to the business side of providing dispute resolution uh, services. So the goal is that by handling or at least streamlining kind of this whole suite of what I call the hard skills, you know, that, and this is just organization, process, flow, control, um, you know, communication, uh, record keeping, all of that sort of stuff is the hard skills. Um, by, by trying to, you know, sort of streamline that, it allows the practitioner to focus more on what are the soft skills that are essential to this, to the, to the profession and the practice. And that's the, you know, building rapport and being able to listen actively and, and uh, express yourself with empathy and so forth. And the goal is that coupling the, you know, the technology and the, um, and the hard skills side with the soft skills, you know, we can improve overall the performance. Uh, of the of the practitioner and the and the service that they provide. So, um, when we just get started uh, with the concept or thinking about um, you know feature enhancement, right? What does my software have today? What should I build next? Um, one th source that I've gone to and that we use uh, significantly now is is the results of a technology poll that was done by the American Bar Association uh, Dispute Resolution Section Technology Committee. And if any of you are interested in seeing the results of the full poll, uh, let me know. It was, uh, but it was actually, it was, you know, quite well done. It was, it was done by, um, we had two uh, research fellows who were assigned to our committee uh, for 2023, uh, Manotho Nongobo and Paula Plaza. Uh, and they were the two that, you know, that really ran this thing. We ended up with over 650 respondents uh, in a pretty nice distribution in terms of type of practice, age, gender, uh, experience level, and so forth. So it's a pretty good look at the, the intended purposes were to try and figure out what are people doing right now in the practice uh, to use and adopt technology and um, what are their attitudes about its future. Um, and I took one uh, one slide out of that that you're looking at here. I edited a little bit to make the labels on the data a little bit more readable. Uh, and, and as you can see, the question was, please choose three technology features most important to you in your practice, regardless of kind of how you have access to it, whether it's embedded in something or uh, you buy it independently or whatever. And I think not surprisingly, as you can see, the red bar at the bottom, uh, the largest single item in that response was at this point. By the way, this, let me back up, the survey was done this year. It was basically launched in the in the spring um, and kind of ran and was was open until summer, uh, uh, late spring, early summer, uh, with some results still trickle, trickling in. So basically it was done in 2023. So the biggest line uh, on the graph, of course, is online video conferencing. Right behind that um, is scheduling. And this, you know, we hear about scheduling a lot. We'll talk more about it because it's one of the features we added um, that, I, that I'll go into in detail. And then uh, as you look down here, digital uh, signing is the next most prevalent. Um, I can say that is next up on our product roadmap. We do not have it in ADR Notable yet. Um, secure document management, we can already do that. So then the next one for us uh, was invoicing, and this is just because we had clients asking for it first, that it skipped the queue a little bit and, and, and got into the line next. So invoicing and payment processing, and I kind of combined that with accounting. Um, the difference being that 
you know, invoicing and payment processing is literally that. It's just getting an invoice created with whatever your billables are in it, uh, time or flat rates or whatever you're doing, uh, getting it out to the client and getting the revenue back, uh, getting paid in some fashion. The accounting, what we think of for that is, is a much broader, uh, it's the enterprise accounting like QuickBooks that you can pay bills out of and you can, you know, can track your financial results and, and so forth. So we, we kind of look at those two together and said, that's where we needed to go next. So with that, I'm gonna jump in and, and, and look at these two things that we added. So one is scheduling and the other is the billing and invoicing. And like I said, sort of based on that, on that survey result, our next one up will be dig digital signature. But scheduling was in our customer context, just so often reported as a major point of frustration uh, that we, we really said to ourselves that we needed to try and address it in some fashion. And, you know, the, the biggest issue is trying to find a common date for uh, a case with multiple parties, some of whom may be represented by counsel who have very tight schedules, very difficult schedules. And there could be, you know, in a basic case, if they're just two parties in their counsel, then you're trying to get five people aligned on a certain date and time, uh, parties, counsel, and, and uh, neutral. And, and of course, sometimes it, it party, or these cases involve many more than that. So when, as, as I think is a standard practice, when, when we were faced with this, we started looking at what's out there. And we looked at products like, you know, Microsoft has had at the time this feature called Find Time, built into their Outlook calendar. Google had a product called Boomerang, which was supposed to help you uh, find uh, a, a scheduled time. And then of course, there were the most familiar products of Calendly and Doodle Polls. Now, Calendly um, has a couple things that we wanted, that we learned, we needed as well. It has the ability, for instance, to share a link so that with anyone, so that somebody can book themselves. This notion of self-booking, big thing on a lot of neutrals websites, you can go and book yourself an hour meeting or a half hour meeting or whatever uh, by, by accessing a link uh, that's, that is a real time uh, link to the, to the neutrals calendar. So we knew we needed that feature. Um, and, and you can also embed those kinds of links in your email signature line, for instance, uh, and it, it and it's it, it those are very helpful features we needed. But the one, the thing we were really trying to tackle is that finding the right time, you know, an efficient way for multiple parties. And that was what we were hearing, just was crushing people's time by, um, by you know, multiple emails. How about these three dates? No, none of those work. Can you propose some more? And you know, there would be twenty emails that would have to go around. Before, uh, before a common time could be located. Um, so, so we looked around, you know, and, and nobody was doing that component with particularly well and until we found a product, um, a company actually in Canada called Calendar Hero. Um, and we, we took a hard look at their product and initially it wasn't quite what we needed, but it was designed to find a common date and, and manage the booking and the appointment a setting for large groups. Um, so it did that well. The one feature that was a pro problematic for us was that it was intended to, for really large groups like classes or conferences even. And it would go ahead and optimize a date, but it, was, it would pick a date that not necessarily everyone listed could attend. So we said, no, wait a minute, that won't work for our purpose. We need to be able to say to, you know, no, everyone must be there before the date can be booked. And they had an existing feature called uh, VIP. You could designate somebody as a mandatory attendee in order to select the time. So we worked with them to basically expand that existing setting so that you could click the button and say, everybody, need, everybody listed needs to be there. So don't book the time unless all uh, invited parties are available. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through what this uh, scheduling looks like now. Uh, just a quick note, 
the product that I'm going to use here to walk you through this is called Story Lane. And it's something we've found recently, and it's really designed for purpose here. It's intended specifically for helping you show or demo a, a uh, software product uh, like ours. And you'll see why it does not have sound component. It's intended either to be entirely prompt based in the written prompts, um, which you'll see in a moment, uh, or as I'm doing a, a simultaneous narrative. So this is what uh, ADR Notable's basic dashboard looks like when you first log in. You're just looking at the top, maybe two thirds of it, which is the list of your cases. And we're gonna start by opening a particular case in which we need to make uh, our scheduling. So we're now in the case dashboard and that uh, the options at the top reside at the, uh, you know, there um, all the time. And we have a single button if you're now trying to schedule a session. And so the, the, the integration then with Calendar Hero starts right. here. And that is we go into the case docket or the case record and pull all of the participants that are listed onto this page um, so that you can select among them. And it's, you know, you can select or deselect here. Uh, the point is that it, probably everybody that's in that's listed as a participant needs to be there. But it is possible, let's say for instance, um, we have a client in Canada, a couple, a few clients now actually use this for um, family counseling and the children will be listed inside the case, but they may not necessarily be being invited to a video conference. So you could deselect them uh, so that your invitation doesn't try and go to people who are not supposed to be there. Okay, so we select the all and then we're gonna just select the set up a meeting. And we've now just moved into the calendar hero dashboard. So you, you continue to move through this. Now, there's some setup work in Calendar Hero. You go in um, prior to its first use and you define the types of, of sessions or meetings that you may want to hold. So typically for a mediator, that's going to be half day session in person, half day session on, online, full day session in person, full day session online, uh, maybe one hour, um, you know, conference calls either via Zoom or phone. So anyway, you, you go in and you select those kinds uh, and you build them, you can label them. Um, you can build in cushion time before and after. There's a bunch of ways you can shape that. But here, we're just going to assume that our, our uh, fictitious um, mediator, Donna Parson, has been taken to her, um, her panel and she's now selecting what type of session she is trying to book. And then you, uh, you give a date parameters. So I want this meeting to occur not sooner than maybe you know, the, the end of November. So maybe you put in December 1st to December 31st, or you adjust whatever period of time you want the, to, to, to have it look at it. Um, so as the note says, she has linked this to her two sets of calendars and it is comparing those calendars and seeing only, and she has set this to find a three hour block of time. That was her meeting type. So she only wants to, to disclose or present to the folks who are gonna receive this invitation, um, things that meet her criteria. So it needs a three hour block of time. And she has gone into this system and told it and don't block these sorts of sessions on Monday or Friday. I use those for work or Monday mornings or Friday afternoons. I use those for work time or whatever. Um, in the agenda box, you can identify the purpose of the meeting. Um, it goes, it, whatever is said in there and, and replies go to all parties. So you want to make sure you don't do anything confidential in there. Okay. And then you just hit the next button. It's now... Uh, populated those invitees uh, that are the, from the email addresses that were in the ADR Notable case record. And from here, you have two choices. You can just let the system do its thing uh, by hitting this green button, or you can get an invitation link and write your own cover email. Uh, no, I, most people don't do the, the latter, they do the former because it's just, I mean, it's a maximizing the utility of this particular software product. 
So you just come down here and hit the button, uh, send invites. Um, and you, you know, get a confirmation that these invitations have been sent out. Now, let me explain what they're going to see, and we're going to see it in a moment. They're going to see a link um, that, that looks like this. So they're going to an email message that says, hi, you know, whatever participant name. This is Kimberly on behalf at Parsons Mediation. Um, and we're trying to set up a meeting. By the way, it does have a on behalf of function or feature. So your, your assistant can do this on your behalf, looking at your calendar on your behalf. Um, and they have this, uh, you know, respond to the meeting request. And, and all that needs to happen now is they click on that and they get what looks like the doodle poll kind of feature uh, where it is showing the, uh, the permitted blocks of time based on your prior definitions at which you, the mediator, or the, or is, are available. And, you know, you ask each of them to, uh, to pick as many as possible that will fit their personal schedules. Okay, no morning sessions. You'll note that, you know, Monday, there's nothing until one o'clock because of uh, her block on that. Uh, and the first uh, person to respond selects as many as he can that will work. Okay. Goes to another day, pick some more. So anyway, Jack now, you know, tries to do as many as uh, options as possible and set and then confirms. Okay. What happens next is whoever logs in next is now informed by the first person's uh, choices and uh, they will be presented with the, the limits, the limited number of things that the first person has seen. And they will then go through the same process of trying to identify as many times as work for them. As, and the moment that all of the parties have, have coalesced around a single acceptable time, the system just takes over. No further work is needed by a human being. The system automatically books it on the neutrals calendar, sends an email message to the neutral to tell them that it has been booked. So they're aware and they can go actually look at their calendar and see that it's there. And then calendar invitations are sent to the uh, all of the participants who responded. If it's a, if it's a Zoom, uh, I think they integrate with other video conferencing as well. But if it's a Zoom video conference, the Zoom meeting information has automatically been added to the calendar invitation. So literally uh, no further action after hitting that send the invitations button is needed by the user. So here you go. All invitees get a notification of meeting time. Uh, and a video conferencing uh, link. They also, so they also get both an invitation and an, and an email message uh, so that they're aware, uh, you know, kind of both ways. And it has all, as you can see, it has the video conference information embedded. So, and, and again, this then also replicates the other components that we knew were important. So you can embed a link on your website, and allow people to choose a time to meet with you, schedule their own time. You can embed that link in your email signature block uh, to do the same thing. So it really has, you know, kind of all of the features we were able to find in any competing product, um, as well as, you know, this really robust capability for, uh, for scheduling a group. I can tell you that we actually went back to the firm that, that uh, first built ADR Notable, and I asked them how much it would cost for them to replicate all of this feature, uh, the feature richness of this software. And they, they laughed at me and told me it would cost almost as much as building ADR Notable did. So the decision on the buy build was made pretty quickly uh, that we would not spend our time and resources rebuilding this, but we would do a deal uh, to let us relicense it. 
So that's how we, you know, that's that's how we did the that step, right, of of scheduling. Now let me tell you about the reverse um, outcome, and that is billing and invoicing, which we have uh, this year then integrated with QuickBooks. And this was, you know, you think of it as you step into it as being very simple, uh, but this is a situation where you know defining the requirements was essential uh, before we made any kinds of decisions, because as we stepped into it gradually, we recognized how complex the range, just the, the the range of options, the variability of how people um, bill, and the scenarios we would have to accommodate. So for instance, hourly rates, multiple hourly rates for the same neutral. That happens often uh, because they have a variable or they have a sliding scale or because they use different rates for prep time than they do for session time. Flat fees for a half day, flat fees for a full day, flat fees for cases, flat fees plus some kind of hourly, which also happens if it's because the Half day may be defined as, a, or even the, the case flat fee may be defined as one full day. And if it requires more than that, it, it does that plus hourly. Billing for expenses, not just time. Splitting the bills, which was a huge issue because the fee splits are not necessarily pro rata, not necessarily 50-50. Many divorce cases, they're negotiated via 100% on one party but they can be negotiated in any kind of split, any percentage. You may have four parties in the room and they're all paying 25% or four parties. And, and despite the fact you have four parties, it's 50-50 between only two of them. So you need to be able to assign the case, the agreed case split for the bill in an in a infinitely varied, uh, varied way. Um, there needed to be billing in advance or billing on, um, on you know, after the services have been provided in arrears, or again, some combination moving back and forth. We need to be able to then to reflect money as held on account, not applicable to uh, pre-existing um, uh, build, build payables. Um, we have now implemented it so that it'll support full lawyer law firm version of trust accounting, where monies are actually physically deposited in a separate bank account. So we had to have the single case managed, managed across two bank accounts. A uh, handful of jurisdictions actually have sales tax on professional services. We had to manage under or over payment, either inadvertently or you know something going wrong or double payment, late payment, penalties on late payment, reminders for late for payments that are past due, forms of payment. So credit card check, wire transfer and so forth communications about how to pay, payment, we now support payment in US dollars, Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, uh, British pounds and euros. Um, and then we have to move on to the recognition of the revenue and record keeping and moving that into an enterprise system like in our case, QuickBooks. So to do this, we looked at LawPay was probably the leading one. We looked at many others and frankly said, um, for the purposes of the of the dispute resolution practitioner, we can do better, um, and so we built this um, ourselves from scratch. Whoops. So let me show you how what that looks like, um, and, and then we'll finish up here. So again, I'm using this story lane device. You're now looking inside a case at uh, the invoice tab, and you can see a historical record here. Uh, this is because it's a test model, but we're going to go backward now and pretend that we're going to get an advance fee. And actually, we are working with a firm that does advance fees in stages throughout the case. So they'll do, it's not just one time. They'll do advance fees for stage one. They will perform the services of stage one, accept the payment out of the account to pay for stage one and rebuild in advance for stage two. So it is possible, you know, that you see exactly the scenario shown here. Uh, where you have to do advance fees multiple times. And, um, and this is something that, of course, you had to accommodate then this money being held on account, which is why this is a little bit tricky. So we work with a concept called billables. Billable is any 
aggregation of something that is uh, you know subject to be inserting into your invoice. So it's some number of hours. There may be several billables, you know, hours from today, hours from yesterday, hours from last week. Uh, there and it also accommodates expenses if uh, as a billable. So if you pay to cater the lunch or whatever, you can put that in. So here you just start by creating a new um, a new invoice and you identify is this a standard invoice or an advanced fee invoice? And that's essential because an advanced one is not going to be applied to any existing billables. A standard one, but you're billing in arrears, you're going to have a collection of billables that you are invoicing for. Um, you can select who in the party representatives gets the bill because sometimes the party gets it, sometimes legal counsel gets it. So during your case setup, uh, you identify the default as to who's getting the bill, but you can actually override that on any particular invoice. Um, we have a table that you can populate for your rates or for, for the rates for any neutral in your firm. And that goes back to that long list I, I gave you earlier of you know, multiple hourly rates, multiple daily rates, half day rate, full case rate, all of those can be preserved and entered with them with a click. So you don't have to go look up anything and you don't have to do manual data entry. So in this case, uh, the parties are being charged a $2,500 advance fee. Whoops. Um, you can add a memo. Um, if you use the timekeeper inside ADR Notable, either to do your tr tracking of your sessions or to add ad hoc time, the description of your work would be pulled over uh, into, the, into, this, into the bill automatically. And here you can add uh, anything else, any other memo that you want to appear on, in a text field on the actual invoice. It can be just a thank you for using our services or whatever you want. So now we've we've you know done our payment terms. We're set up by default and do on re, on return or on receipt. Due date was going to be applied since I did this demo a few days ago. It's a little bit late, but uh, the amount and so forth. Okay. So now we have these uh, outstanding invoices in our list. Uh, what the client will see um, is uh, an email that looks like this. It, and it can all be branded appropriately. Again, the subject line is branded as well. Um, this text, this message, the actual text of the email is another part of your setup that you can create in it, you know, one time. You don't have to write new emails. The system is generating this email. Your human being is not. So this is all automated. Okay, that's what it looks like in Gmail. And this is what um, the actual invoice looks like. You can put your own logo on it uh, to personalize it. Uh, the full amount uh, is due, that is due. In basic invoice information, the advance fee charge. This is the text memo that you could put in when you were creating the, the, the uh, uh, invoice. And then here are the various ways that you can pay. If you will accept a check, you write out how to make it payable, where to mail it. We have integrated with Stripe. Stripe facilitates either credit card or ACH payments, uh, automated clearinghouse payments that you can do through that. And, and when you click on that, it'll just take you to a link and let you do it. You could also set up like wire transfer instructions or any other way that you, uh, that you wanna try and get paid. The virtue to using our embedded credit card processor is the payment comes in and is automatically applied inside the bookkeeping in ADR Notable if the, if the Stripe feature is used. And if you do use Stripe, this is what this is, uh, you know, that Stripe is one of the biggest uh, payment processors out there. Um, and so it's a pretty commonly used interface. You can actually set Stripe up to pass along the credit card fee as added into the invoice, which is why you may see this invoice look a little bigger than, um, than, than we were expecting. Um, if they do pay outside of Stripe, either by paper check or wire transfer, 
then you do have to go in and manually uh, um, add the information. And you do that just by you know, taking your paper check and holding it in your left hand while you click apply payment. Um, and then you put in how much you received, check number and so forth for good record keeping. And then uh, it will actually generate and send a zero balanced uh, statement. So everybody knows uh, that it's been, that that invoice has been paid. When you send a standard invoice, this process is largely the same. Um, the timekeeping can, as I mentioned, can be created either inside our timers while you're working inside the ADR Notable app, or you can add ad hoc time. That gets moved into the billing automatically. But you can also, particularly if it's a short one-time case, you just go ahead and set it up one, one bill without keeping track of all of that. Um, choose what kind of, uh, of service you provided or whether this is either service or expenses. Again, you identify the parties, you check to make sure the split is correct. In this case, it's been negotiated uh, um, as a 100% um, paid by one party. Here is my rate type index for this particular uh, neutral. So I can override this if I need to put in some sort of ad hoc amount, but it's uh, most parties can create their range of their potential fee structure so that it's uh, inserted with a click and not annual and not manually entered. Number of hours and a case description or the work description at the bottom. Sorry, I moved a little too fast. But um, and then once your invoices are right, you have a kind of a second check at them. Uh, you look at the invoices that are about to go out to each party. In this case, they've been split, indicated by the asterisk. Um, if you do have advanced, if there's advanced money on account, um, you can it can be applied automatically, as we'll do in this case. So the, the invoice is for thirty five hundred. Uh, the advance fee balance is less, so we're just going to apply the entire thing. Oops, I keep wanting this to work the way it normally works, and then it'll calculate the amount still owed and create the. Um, the invoice appropriately and indicate in your record keeping that this invoice is partially paid and showing the balance due of a thousand, roughly a thousand dollars. Sends out the standard invoice, which looks like our other one, except it has work description and hours uh, and, and what professional actually provided the services uh, line item down on the invoice. And it indicates the uh, application of the advance fee and then you go on to the standard payment uh, methodologies. So that's a look at, at, at how we you know, added these two features. And we, we're in the process of doing this again with digital signature. So we've you know, gone out to the several signature, digital signature providers. We've talked to a lot of parties and you, know, we, you get quirky pieces of requirements that you know you need when you go shopping to see if you are, are gonna build or buy. For instance, um, I had never thought about this until you know detailed questioning of, of users, but sometimes you're sending out a settlement agreement um, and you don't actually know who will be signing it. This will happen particularly if it, the party is a corporation and whoever's the council that you're working with has to take that document somewhere into the organization and get the appropriate level officer to sign it to make it binding. Somebody who may have no other contact to the actual uh, mediation whatsoever. So you need to be able to, the digital signature system you choose needs to be able to send out a document for digital signature that allows the recipient to identify the name and title of the person actually doing the execution. So there's, I mean, the, the amount of energy that you spend in getting your requirements detailed before you either go shopping uh, or or try and uh, obviously assign this to be built is that you can't do too much. It's not possible for you to have too detailed a set of ideas about what the product exactly has to do in every permutation you can dream up, right? Of, of failure in one system, somebody signs it and now it has to be signed by somebody different and you have to go backward. I mean, how do you reverse things? I mean, all of those kinds of elements are essential to this process. 
So that's that's uh, my run through of sort of this year's activity and a deep dive into what it's like for the system providers to to add features and what you go through in terms of identifying the requirements and then don't, don't doing shopping in the marketplace for who offers the best alternative. Um, and it's usually all about the feature set that they provide and, and secondarily about the price. Um, so that's been our experience so far with the digital signature shopping that we're doing. Any questions about that? I'd be happy to happy to engage in this conversation more because it's it's a vital part of the life of any one of our service, you know, technology service providers trying to figure out how to improve and, and keep trying. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gary. Wow, this is you've done such amazing work, and the platform really has evolved incredibly over the last year. Uh, so kudos to you and your team. I know how hard it is to implement some of these things. Does anybody have any questions or feedback or uh, on the points that Gary raised? Anybody want to chime in? Tina, you're the one person on video, so I'm tempted to cold call you, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, but Teresa, Danae, anybody else? I'd be interested too if anybody has you know a feature they've always wanted to see embedded in a case management tool and it's not there. Hmm. What, what's the next biggest one you would add if you were in my shoes? I was wondering what type of support do you offer for the end user? Yeah, so we have um, one full-time employee um, who, and a, there, well, let me back up. First of all, there's a very extensive help function in the app itself. So pretty much nearly any question you could come up with, it, you may be able to get the answer within the app, we use a service called um, up that, that, that you know, creates your knowledge base uh, called Zendesk uh, that it organizes, it makes a keyword searchable and so forth. So a lot of information embedded in the app. Second potential source, we have a lot of how-to videos in YouTube. We have a full YouTube channel. So if you're trying to figure out, for instance, how to do the billing, you may be able to go and watch at your own pace, at your own leisure, a video about how we do that. Third, we do have a we have a help ticket function, uh, so you can actually send us an email right from the app or just a regular email, um, and that is monitored basically from uh, morning to night Eastern time zone to Pacific time zone, um, and frankly on the weekends too. Although I don't like to say that out loud because we don't actually often promise that, but as a practical matter, it is, and that's picked up by our full time employees. Our um, Director of Customer Success. It also goes to our Chief Operating Officer, and it goes to our Lead Tech guy who's out in California. So with that, we will be back in touch promptly, and and kind of then it's kind of whatever take whatever it takes. We certainly hold hands with people going through setup on a regular basis. We do demos for free, uh, and you can and they're interactive and they're live, so you can sign up and dig deep into one particular issue if that's what you needed uh, for that demo period. Um, and, and then we'll we'll do ad hoc calls and, and set up things to to get you onboarded and and you know successfully using the product in in all respects. And I mean we just onboarded uh, onboarded a firm in Denver and pay for and we we've, we've spent lots of time with them uh, trying to get their system uh, get the person the chief administrator is not particularly uh, comfortable with technology. So it's it's been a very patient process of. Of trying to go over things and we've been recording some of the ad hoc demos we've done so that she can go back and look at them again in her own time um, and, and things like that. We're using AI Companion in Zoom uh, pretty much every time we do a demo now to produce a summary of that uh, that we send to the participants afterwards. So we, we try, you know, kind of we try to meet you where you are and, and help you in whichever way you learn best and, and we can help best. Thank you for answering that question. I was wondering, do you have a tracking mechanism or any means of if a mediator wanted to measure um, success rate or anything of that nature? Is, is that a possibility? Yep. So there's a, there's a status bar on every case, including when you've concluded, it was concluded successfully, partially successfully, or, un, or not successfully. Um, there's time, you know, there's time tracking built into it. And that, so 
and all of that data can be can be pulled at the end. There's a way to pull it either by individual mediator or across a firm, and it's it has variables including case type, um, individual mediator or service provider, um, hours, outcome, and then you put date parameters on your search. There's some other. There's at least one more variable I'm missing right now, but. Yeah, yeah, we have data reporting at the back end uh, of the product that you can look at. Oh, you can track referrals who, who referred you cases. So you can, you know, you get that kind of CRM function out of it. So you know who's sending you cases and you know who to, you know, send a, send a present to in the holidays or whatever. Oh, great. That's, that's interesting. And if for some reason you need to reschedule a case, I'm wondering, you can can you do that? Does it have that functionality where you can reschedule and everyone gets made aware that there's been um, some kind of scheduling conflict? Yeah, that, so the, the Calendar Hero folks have really thought this through very well, which is why we ended up partnering with them. So not only is there kind of a redo button, right? This didn't work, let everybody know, trying it again. But it also has features like, let's say you, you got you know, you didn't get any acceptable dates in your first effort. You can go in and see where the voting lined up. So if there was one date and time that got five out of six, you could figure out who the six was and maybe give them a call and say, listen, everybody can make this date and time, but are you sure you can't, you know, or do we really have to go restart it? Um, and then you have a couple of choices if it failed. You know, you can expand the time window is the usual thing that people do. So let's say you couldn't get it between December 1 and December 31st. Okay, well then you say, all right, that didn't work. Let's look at January, you know, first two weeks of January or something and you do it again. Uh, but yeah, you can cancel. Um, of course, nothing happens until all six have, have done it. But then if some condition changes and you have to reschedule, uh, there is a process built in the calendar here. It'll lead you through that too. Yeah, they've been, I mean, they- they did a great job with that product. We're very, very happy with it. And people, you know, people often laugh and say, I'm uh, just getting, buying all of ADR Notable just to get to that calendar function is probably worth, <laughs> the, worth the effort. So. And they've been good to work with too. Like I said, they've made changes to their product uh, specifically on our behalf uh, to make it fit the need uh, more closely. So That's great. Thank you. Sure. All right. Any any other questions for Gary? All right. Uh, looks like Brandon has a question for you. I'm a college student in Leah Wing's class, so I don't have the most experience, but I'm curious, have most of your users paid by case or by yearly subscription? What have you done to encourage more lawyers and mediators to use this software? Oh, that's a good question. Great question. So uh, it, interesting, you know, when we set out pricing this thing, <laughs> that's been one of the biggest debates ever. I was confident that the right answer was to, pay, to price it by case. I just said, no, you know, it just buy as you go. Why would you not do that? If I were a mediator, I'd buy by the case and I would first, my first invoice out the door would split the cost <laughs> of, of the case, of the technology, and I would never see it in my overhead. Um, but I got overwhelmed. I was immediately reversed on that. Everybody told me, no, nobody likes that. <laughs> Everybody wants fixed, you know, they want to know what their fixed bill is. They don't want to pass along small charges because it looks like they're nickel and diming their clients. And so in the end, um, you know, in a solemn, Solomon like, you know, decision, we did have all of the above. So you can buy it by the case, you can buy it by the month and you can buy it by the year. And very few people, as it turned out, are buying it by the case. They're so much for my idea. Um, most buy it by the year. That's the majority. And you get a little bit of a discount off the total price if you subscribe by the year. You get 10% off what could be an otherwise monthly time 12. And then, um, you know, the, and the others buy on a monthly basis. Now, I, I, you know, I should kind of forewarn people, we are going to do a price increase probably at the beginning of next year. We're still trying to figure out how to do that. We've added these features. We haven't moved our price since we've added these features. So, I mean, our, our product is generates substantially more value today than it used to. Mm -hmm. So we're going to adjust it appropriately. And we, I, you know, likely we're going to do tiered pricing for a, sort of a bronze, silver, gold levels. I want to keep one product line, for instance, that's 
very streamlined that does not have the billing and does not have the calendar in it. Uh, because as I work with ombuds people, they don't need those features. They just need the case management component. So I'm going to you know, keep a base level that, that fits their need. And then we'll add to it after that. That's great. The other, the other thing I think I'm going to try and do is maybe lower the per case fee to, to, to keep, because I hear so many new mediators who don't have the volume yet. So I'm going to make it easier for them to get started in ADR Notable and not have a, a you know, check they have to write every month if they didn't have cases this month. So I'm going to try and lower that and make it easier and let them build their cases, build their their uh, their case, their practice more gradually. That's great. Now, Tina asked, could, does it generate tax information? Um, no. So, uh, well, let me say this. One of the things we did create in the billing is it turns out there are a handful of jurisdictions that um, actually have a sales tax on professional services as you go out throughout the United States. It'll do that for you. Um, in terms of tax information on say your your income as an entity, you knew you would need to move it into QuickBooks uh, to be able to do that. Got it. All right, any last questions for Gary? Well, Gary, this is amazing. I think you're going to get a lot of people signing up on the basis of this demo, and uh, <laughs> there may be more questions coming your way. But uh, again, kudos to you on the yeah, platform. Always it's happy really, to do it. Yeah, I think it's the best product available for individual mediators. I mean, you just really thought through everything. And thank you also for going to all these conferences, meeting everybody in person, <laughs> engaging and getting face-to-face -face, uh, feedback. Yeah, so. somehow, I, I'm not quite sure how we managed to not be at the same conference. But I guess we were at one, were we? We, we see each other. We, we were at ABA. We but were I know how many you do, and I know how many I do. And that's, how, <laughs> that's we, right. We're weaving that in and out and only ran each other once this year. Well, if, if you don't mind, let me just take the screen back. Um, sure. I, we only have five minutes left, but I, I did say that I would show a little bit of our platform. So let me do that quickly here. Um, okay. So I think you should be seeing a screen from ODR.com. We can do another demo during Cyber Week as well to sort of show, show off the full functionality here. I think the difference between ADR Notable and ODR.com is I think we mainly focus on the enterprise level. You know, so it's not so much individual mediators so much as large organizations who are managing large caseloads. So you can see here, this is a this is an arbitration focused platform. You know, it has a bunch of different cases on it and you can click into any individual case and it creates an online collaborative meeting room in essence, where the parties can log in. I'm logged in administrator here, but you can see the detail in terms of what was filled out on the filing form. Uh, this is an arbitration platform, so we have counterclaim functionality. You can see all the documents that have been uploaded in the case organized by type. You can see all the users on an individual case and the roles that they've been assigned to, and you can assign new people to the case. Um, we have very robust calendar functionality and we have integrated payments. So, uh, you know, neutrals can get paid. They can submit their, their bills. And I'll show you what this looks like on an enterprise level. So from a finance perspective, you can see all of the payments that are made. Um, your individual customers can maintain escrows that they use to pay out. Your neutrals can submit their bills and everything is centrally managed here. Uh, we've got a mail center, so you, you can configure all your templates and you can send mails to individual parties from those templates. And you have a stored correspondence that tracks all the emails sent out when they were received. You can manage all your users, your staff people, your parties, which are really the parties and the attorneys. And we also have very robust panel management functionality. So you can come in and you can look at all of your you know, this is this isn't live data, obviously. But uh, so you could take a look at Dumbledore if he's a, an arbitrator on your platform. And uh, this is again all soft configurable, so you can see all of the expertise here. Um, you know that that this neutral has, and it can be very fine grained. These are healthcare related disputes, so you can see reimbursement, employment, all the different kinds of cases. They can specify their training, their fees and hours, their rosters, and that helps when you assign a case. So let me move my Zoom window over here. But this is an example of what it looks like when a party logs in. So it's much simpler. And when I log into a party, one of the functionalities in this particular instance is we actually have um, arbitrator ranking. So I, have, as the case manager, is assigned a panel of 10 potential panelists to this case. And as a party, I can come in and I can organize them by preference here. And I can look at their bios you know, by clicking there. I can also specify who I want to eliminate from consideration. 
but because I've only asked for 10 neutrals, I can't eliminate more than two. So once I submit all of my preferences here, I click submit and then it comes back here. And then I, as the neutral, can go into that case and see the preferences registered by the parties and then assign the appropriate neutral panel to that case. So, you know, it's a very powerful enterprise class case management system. Um, we also have uh, integrated reporting through Amazon QuickSight. So all the data generated in the platform can be uh, shared with QuickSight. So you can generate whatever dashboards you need in real time. And these dashboards update based on new cases. So if new cases come in and they're filed, um, you know, you can see your dashboards update and you can share these dashboards publicly. So we didn't build QuickSight, but we did integrate to QuickSight so that all the data in everybody's instances are visible there. Now I will say we, we have other um, presentation layers for the platform. This is one we've built for divorce cases in Ecuador. So you can see we've skinned it in, uh, so I have the ability to assign a mediator. Um, I can come and look at the details of the case and documents that have been uploaded in the case. Um, I can see the conversation back and forth between the parties. Well, that's another thing it's interesting to show you. Um, this is also here, a uh, discussion functionality integrated into the platform. You can create caucus rooms. So this is the joint session here with people can post messages. And then I, as a mediator, can create new caucus rooms with individual parties so I can have a private discussion. And I have the ability also as a mediator to pause the discussion at any point. So the parties can still see their messages, but they can't post new messages. So that's, that's functionality we leverage very heavily in the Ecuador family platform. Um, and you can see, you can track your agreements by area. So this is all in Spanish. We've got notifications here. Uh, the last thing I'll share just before we break is um, we're doing a lot of work in e-commerce resolutions too. So we've built a platform called Resolution Center um, that's intended to help resolve disputes between buyers and sellers online. And essentially as an admin, I can come in and create as many companies or merchants as I like. And then the merchants all have dashboards as well where they can log in and they see statistics about how many cases they've had. Um, they can uh, automate their responses and the offers that they provide to merchants. So there's a lot happening here on this front. So I'll show you if I pick up one of the merchants in here, you know, then I can create a claim associated with that particular merchant and resolve it. So, you know, these are all variants on the core ODR.com platform. Um, so we're doing a lot of, uh, as I say, we're doing arbitrations, we're doing mediations, we're doing landlord tenant cases with the California Association of Realtors, we're doing uh, e-commerce cases, we're doing workplace, we're doing family, but it's all this core. Oh, the other thing I'll show you very quickly is um, if I'm logged in as an administrator, I have the ability to come in and completely reconfigure the entire platform live. I can change all of the information that's gathered on each form. I can create new fields. I can generate new reports. Um, I can change my intake. So this is what this is what an intake looks like. You can embed it anywhere on the internet. And when you click a link, it opens up an intake form. And then when this form is filled out, um, it submits that information directly into the case management system. So you see that in your intakes category. So. So yeah, the platform is very robust, um, very configurable, very scalable. So that's essentially the way ODR.com works. So I'm, I'm happy to provide more detail and a, a deeper demo, but that's just with the time that we had. So why don't I stop my share? Anybody have any last comments or questions or thoughts before we break? I, I, that, that platform is what ADR Notable wants to be when it grows up. <laughs> Hardly. We're servicing different markets, but uh, there's a lot of features you've got that I'd like to integrate too. So <laughs> maybe at some point they'll get married and have a baby, Gary. That's that's what I like. I say having a software platform is kind of like owning an elephant. It's cool. You're like, hey, I own an elephant, but the elephant gets sick and the elephant needs <laughs> food and it poops everywhere and eventually it dies. You have to get a new elephant. So uh, you and I were in we're in similar boats uh, trying to maintain our software platforms. Tina, did you have a question you wanted to ask? No, just thank I'm I'm thanking both of you for the good work you've been doing in the field. It looks amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I so appreciate it. And thanks thanks to everybody for dialing in. Next time we got to get Shane to show off his new era ADR platform because that's very cool. Yeah. And obviously Danae's been working on the Modria platform, which is also amazing. So. Um, with that, why don't we wrap it up? Gary, thank you so much for, uh, for the demo. I'll post the video later today. And uh, it was great to see you all. Thanks for taking the time. And hopefully we'll see you at the other Cyber Week events the rest of the week. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye, everybody. Great work. Thank you.